so as uh, Dan said, we have a wonderful session, uh, putting no pressure on our speakers, but you really will want to come back after lunch and make sure you see these speakers because you'll regret if you miss them. Um, so I'm gonna, just going to give a very quick overview. Um, I know we, we want to stick to our time here. Um, the chairs are myself and, and Jeff Brooke will be chairing the session uh, with a focus on the climate penalty, how heat and carbon dioxide influence ozone exposures and health. We have a fantastic lineup of speakers, um, which I'll just briefly run through right now, and then we'll give a full introduction as they come each come up for a talk. Um, and uh, let's see. Okay, there we go. So just to put this in a little bit of context, what we're gonna talk about today, um, we're gonna to focus on ozone and ozone has come up a couple of times throughout the session. So I think most people are well aware of, of the importance of ozone in our discussion about air pollution and health. Um, just to emphasize the fact that ozone uh, continues to be a problem in, in some areas, more so in some areas of the world than others. There is uh, quite a bit of um, heterogeneity in terms of the exposure um, and the concentrations that, that people see throughout the world. Um, and interestingly, the, the trends over time are, are not consistent in, in locations either. Uh, sorry. Um, and then uh, concurrently, we uh, see the burden of ozone, which uh, again is, is fairly uh, important and has been changing over time. But also, again, interesting to note that we see distinct patterns globally, um, that we, we, don't, we, we see some disparity and some differences uh, in the uh, burden of ozone exposure in, in human populations as well. So I thought this, uh, the, a screenshot of the State of Global Air website kind of captures this session very well. So we know that ozone is a global problem. It's, uh, it's obviously uh, creates a substantial burden in terms of human health um, and disability. And we think about ozone being on the rise, but the, the story is not always that clear as we'll hear during the session today. Um, so in some places, uh, ozone exposures are going up, some places they're going down or plateauing over time. Um, and it's not always a, um, a consistent story globally. So we'll hear more about that as well. And then we always hear about this connection with climate. So there's uh, some, uh, we, we always talk about the climate penalty, um, which you might've noticed in, in the title of the talk, it was in quotes because uh, again, we always think that ozone is going to be um, increasing as the influence of climate um, appears over time and, and has more influence over time. But again, the story is not always that clear. So um, we're gonna have some discussion today looking further into all of these, these topics. So, sorry, there seems to be a delay here. So we will um, have uh, some wonderful speakers. I'm just looking for the order here. So a couple of very important notes again to, uh, to remember. So we will start with our first two speakers, which we'll introduce in a, in a minute. Um, make sure that you come back after lunch. We will break for lunch in the middle of this session. And then after the session, we'll continue with our final two speakers. So really important. We have some fantastic talks after lunch. So make sure you come back in here after lunch and, and finish the session. Also note a bit different than some of our other, other sessions that we will be taking questions after each talk. We don't have a final panel discussion session for, for uh, overarching questions. So make sure if you have questions for each speaker to, to get them in um, after, each, uh, after each talk. So without further ado, uh, we can go on to our first speaker. So we can load those slides and I'll go on with the introduction. So our first speaker is Noelle Celine. Uh, Noelle is a professor in the Institute for Data Systems and Society and the Department of Earth, Atmospheric and Planetary Sciences at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. She is also the director of MIT's Technology and Policy Program. Her research uses atmospheric chemistry modeling to inform decision-making on sustainability challenges, including air pollution, climate change, and hazardous substances. Her work also examines interactions between science and policy and international environmental negotiations, 
and develop systems approaches to address sustainability challenges. So we will start with uh, Noel with the driving factors and leverage points influencing ozone concentrations. So uh, Noel Celine is joining us online. Uh, so we will, Noel, are you, can you hear us? And are you ready to go? Yes, can you hear me? Oh, we can, perfectly. Thank you, go ahead. Perfect, and you can see my slides. We can, thank you. Excellent. Well, thanks so much for the invitation and, and for organizing such a compelling session. Uh, so in my presentation, I'm gonna take a systems view to really survey some of the driving factors that are influencing ozone concentrations today and what might be influencing them in the future. And in that, I'm gonna focus on identifying potential leverage points um, that can help address ozone exposure and its health impacts. Um, I'll first survey briefly our understanding of how of what changes in ozone are and how they can happen. And next I'll give a little bit of an introduction to the different drivers of potential change, some of the research that has come up out of my group's effort to model some of the um, directions of that change. Um, and also emphasizing the different kinds of policy levers that can interact to affect the ozone problem. Uh, I'll then talk about how we can think about observational constraints, um, attributing the status and trends in ozone to different causes, and again, in order to form, inform better decisions. And finally, I'll end with introducing a new approach to thinking about greenhouse gas and precursor emissions controls together, going beyond the sort of simple story of the climate penalty and really complicating that in a way that can, can help assess what's going on in a, in a fuller, more three-dimensional picture. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll jump right in. Uh, so when we look at changes in ozone, I pulled this graph from the US EPA, which shows trends in ozone at national scale for the past two decades, um, including changes in the mean, the 90th, and the 98th percentile. And there are several factors in general that drive this kind of trend. Um, one of those is, is meteorology. And you'll see on the right that the dotted line uh, shows the adjustment the EPA makes to correct for changes in meteorology and ozone trends. Um, both Short-term variability, so the the day-to-day -day and and year-to-year -year variation in weather, and long-term change, uh, that is changes in climate, both affect ozone. Of course, emissions also affect ozone. Uh, emissions of NOx and VOCs, uh, largely that's a local effect, but there's also long-range transport effects. I'm going to focus on these two primary drivers for the most part in this talk, but. I want to highlight that in my focus on these immediate causes, the ones that we can trace with models, I don't want to minimize the systemic factors that are at play here. Things like governance structures, infrastructure lock-in, and in particular systemic inequities, especially those inequities that lead to individual and social vulnerabilities to air pollution impacts. And those are factors we hope to be able to tackle more directly with modeling in the future. Um, but right now they're in the background really of all the modeling I'll, I'll show today. Oh. So, with respect to climate, it's really clear that many of the changes that climate change will bring to meteorology will affect ozone, and these go in different directions. I'm showing a, a figure from a recent review paper that presented updated knowledge about what the state of science on these connections are. Um, what they do is, is talk about the particular processes, the atmospheric um, meteorological processes, the general level of confidence that a warmer climate uh, leads to increases in, in surface ozone, and that impact, whether it's positive and or negative, um, at, from a background or a local and regional um, level. And I'll highlight a few, um, one of which is tropospheric water vapor, um, which with high confidence decreases background uh, surface ozone, and heat waves and, and regional stagnation, uh, which with a medium level of confidence increase local to regional ozone. And what a variety of different models have done um, over the past uh, decade or more is really evaluate how each of these factors in combination um, sort of combines in a future climate and in one given future climate scenario uh, to affect what is typically referred to as, as the climate penalty uh, to really think about what if at constant level of emissions, a future climate will bring in terms of changes in ozone. And the understanding of that and the, the causal factors are really improving with time. Um, so this is a, one of those studies that, that my group did um, in 2015. Overall in the Eastern US, um, many of the models historically have agreed that with a warmer climate, uh, climate change under constant emissions, precursor emissions will lead to increases in ozone. Um, and this has been referred to as the, the climate penalty. 
Um, although you'll see in a later slide, I don't find that term particularly helpful in a changed future because overarching climate and energy policy is really a key lever that combines with precursor and emission policy in very complex ways. So thinking about a one dimensional kind of penalty, uh, while helpful for sort of a mental model of what's happening, uh, doesn't, doesn't necessarily bring us very far. It's not like a constant tax, but hold that thought for a bit. Um, and I'll show you, show you what sort of the, the traditional view of the, the climate penalty brings you. Um, and basically what the study that we did was look at a reference case with a high degree of warming and a greenhouse gas policy um, that keeps precursor emissions, NOx and VOCs constant, importantly also methane constant, um, and looks at what happens to ozone over the United States. And this greenhouse gas policy um, mitigates a lot of that, um, that penalty. Now, a different, slightly different way of looking at this is to consider the ozone benefits in the, US gas, in the US to greenhouse gas reductions by the year 2100 or the year 20, uh, 2050. On the left, showing that overall pattern in 2100 graphically. The numbers to the right show what we calculated as the differences in population weighted daily maximum eight hour ozone, increasing by 0.8 and 3.2 parts per billion under our um, under our reference case, the high warming scenario. Under our climate policy scenario, um, that's greenhouse gases only, um, precursor emissions staying constant, 0.3 to 0.6 parts per billion. Um, but as we know, precursor emissions are already changing. And of course, the energy transition required to get to this type of climate policy will of course have impacts, especially on NOx emissions, where you're thinking about transitions to, for example, cleaner uh, energy sources, electric vehicles, and so forth. Uh, so this is actually a study that we did looking essentially the other way around, keeping the climate constant and looking how under greenhouse gas policy, precursor emissions and thus ozone concentrations might change as a result of greenhouse gas controls. And this was the result of an integrated model we used, linking an economic and emissions projection model to an air quality simulation. We looked at three different policies that cut the same amount of CO2 emissions in the US, but took it out of different sectors in the near term. And this was, this was a, a study that we did looking at uh, some earlier versions of climate policy that looked at 2030 goals. And one of the things that that showed is that there's a quite a bit of variability in ozone in particular, which follows largely where and when NOx is cut. And there's not a constant response of NOx to the um, ratio of NOx and CO2 in your controlled sources is what's really mattering here. Um, all of these policies lead to, led to widespread decreases in ozone concentrations relative to our baseline. But under a transportation-focused policy, uh, where CO2 was largely taken out of the transport sector, um, that was the greatest decrease, not surprisingly, because it's a high NOx source. Um, and also that led to some increases in ozone actually in urban regions where the chemistry was NOx saturated and thus nonlinearity kicked in, decreases in NOx um, are projected to lead to decreases in ozone. So just to summarize, you have these two, these two different um, levers that we know about, one of which is um, mitigating climate warming, takes away kind of that climate penalty. The second is what's, what's traditionally referred to as kind of co-benefits, um, mitigating CO2 sources, um, reduces in primarily NOx emissions, and that leads to less formation of ozone. Now, those two things in the real world are happening simultaneously. I'm going to highlight a nice study by Drew Schindel and others. Um, they did this past year, and they looked at a particular simulation combining the climate and emissions in influences, looking at a 1.5 degree climate policy, and ultimately calculating benefits due to environmental exposures. And when you add this all together, um, you, they show uh, widespread benefits across the US once you total these effects. And again, there's going to be some variability and some some policy um, and some policy distinctions here. Um, that's that's great, but you know, I asked the question: Okay, so where are we on climate policy um, at a national scale or at an international scale? Um, and and that's where you start to think about: Okay, so what does the real world policy context actually look like? Um, and what are the prospects for for these kinds of policies, particularly with um, with 2030 goals? And I'm not going to talk about um, talk about that. You can have um, some discussions, I guess, over over lunch about that um, and see what what the latest news is from from Washington. 
Um, but it's pretty clear that for greenhouse gases, um, what's going to happen if there is a policy delay? The cumulative amount of carbon emissions matter. What might be less clear is, is actually the impact of delay in implementing ozone policy. And uh, we did some, some work a couple of years ago that showed that delaying implementation of ozone policy, um, that is cutting precursor emissions, also has a cumulative impact. Uh, this was a paper that was led by Rebecca Seri, who's now at, um, at Waterloo. And we looked at the cost of delay in ozone reduction by income group. And we monetized the benefits of ozone policies by income groups, and they, they were substantial. Uh, but when there were delays in implementing the policies, the deferred benefit ended up hurting the lowest income populations more. And the right side of this graph shows our, our figure on that with the red shading in, indicating the relative benefit of that policy by income group. And, and the red shading is that, that cost of delay. Uh, so that's sort of the, what I'm thinking in terms of the um, greenhouse gas and, and different ozone policies. Again, many of that's, um, that's been delayed and tied up in the courts for many years and then has very physical manifestations as you're thinking about um, the impacts of, of ozone that aren't necessarily straightforward, aren't just in the atmosphere. Uh, another way of thinking about climate policy, um, another example of how climate policy is going, um, my group did a study led by um, for a PhD student, Mingwei Li, um, looking at climate policy in China. What happens to precursor emissions if China implements a moderate climate policy and looks at Trans-Pacific transport um, and impacts ultimately on ozone concentrations in the United States? We had saw surprisingly large impacts in the Western United States, uh, 0.2 to 0.3 parts per billion, adding up to thousands of avoided deaths. Um, and that's that's a fairly substantial number considering the comparison of the types of um, ozone uh, controls that are proposed in the US context. And this is from climate policy, particularly in China and the so-called co-benefits of, of that policy. So, so these are the kinds of potential drivers of, of change. And, and you can see just from this, uh, this brief summary that they interact in some complex ways. Uh, so in the next part of this talk, I'm gonna talk, bring this to bear on how to understand how these different levers act to get some insights sort of by asking the question a little bit backwards. Um, and this kind of follows the, um, in, in sort of the spirit of, of HEI, the chain of accountability. So can the influence of each of these different levers be actually causally diagnosed? Um, and when could we, could we see these impacts when in actually um, monitoring? And this is first sort of to look at climate. Uh, this is from our earlier study um, led by Fernando Garcia Menendez looking at the magnitude of the ozone climate penalty. Uh, but this looks at it from our ensemble, um, ensemble simulation. It shows the variability in our different projections of the climate penalty due to variability. This is not underlying change. This is just variability in meteorology for different years consistent with our climate projection in the year 2100. Um, so I'll pull just two of these to show the difference. And as you can see, depending on which year of meteorology you pull, the penalty can actually switch sign. Now, overall, when you average over the, over the whole climate, it is a penalty, um, but these variabilities are really important because each year we'll experience actually only one of these. We don't experience the average. Um, so there is, there is variability across those, that different meteorology. And that variability um, manifests in, particular ways in our ability to see whether that ozone-related climate penalty is influencing uh, ozone. So this is for showing for the, the Northeast US, where each of those lines is one realization of our ensemble simulation of future climate. So the uncertainty around one year of simulation is very wide. Um, you'd estimate between minus six and plus eight parts per billion, as opposed to the mean value of around two. That means that there's the potential for getting the wrong sign in terms of attribution in, in the Northeast, unless you average over several years, um, up to 15 to 20. But correspondingly, that also means you might live in a year that has that opposite sign, which is important as we move into the future climate um, in order to understand, understand variability and, and make uh, appropriate decisions. So that's, that's causality for the climate. Um, what about the the influence of meteorology versus policy. Um, and the 
this is this is a challenge of that is going to both be particularly challenging in a changing climate. Um, that prompted some of some of our most recent work. This is um, with recently graduated P uh, PhD student Ming Hao Chu. Uh, he's now a postdoc at Stanford, and this um, work is currently under review at ACPD. Uh, typically, researchers working with observational data will try to use statistical methods to correct for this meteorological variability to figure out what the residual emissions-driven change is. Uh, again, this is important for attribution. Um, you know, the the actual emissions concentrations is important for exposure and, and what we actually live in. So, but this is in order to figure out um, how to calculate that residual emissions driven change. And what we did was devise an experiment to test out the different ways that researchers try to do this to see if, you know, they're actually accurate. And we used the GeoSCAM model. And basically what we did is design a scenario which we called the counterfactual. What would happen if we just had constant meteorology? We used emissions changes for 2011 to 2017 in the United States. What would we see? Um, and we ran GeoSCAM. And then what we ran GeoSCAM with an, what we call an observational scenario, what would you actually observe in the real world? What we're gonna try to do is correct using statistical methods, try to recover that counterfactual simulation, what would happen if the meteorology hadn't varied? Um, and then we'll see then the influence of emissions. Now, we thought this would be a little bit easier in model world as, you know, the relationships are actually determined by the model. So we're just statistically correcting for something that we programmed in. Um, turns out it's not that easy. And we have some really interesting and sort of counterintuitive results about the prospects for uh, correcting for, for that meteorology. So here's, here's what we came up with. Um, the counterfactual ozone trends, that's the emissions driven trends. So if meteorology stayed constant, what would happen when you re decreased emissions? Notably, that's similar to a lot of the kinds of, um, you know, regulatory um, ep episodes that are simulated in, in a model analysis, such as regulatory impact analysis, really thinking about that, um, that influence of emissions under constant meteorology. So what we hope to recover was on the left, the relative errors of different statistical techniques we tried are on the right. Um, uncorrected, there was substantial error, not, not surprisingly, but sometimes even in the sign of the uh, change you'd calculate, that's if you don't correct for meteorology. Um, often you'll see observational studies that use multiple linear regression, which is here MLR in the middle. Um, that didn't do much better. We also tried generalized ag additive models. Uh, US EPA historically used a generalized additive model of temperature, wind direction, speed, humidity, pressure, stability, and, and a few other things, including synoptic weather, um, to form, perform weather corrections in assessing long-term ozone trends. Um, that didn't do great either. Uh, we tried random forest and lasso um, using both local and regional meteorological features. And we, we actually found the random forest method that used regional features was the best performing. Uh, but it still really wasn't great. We got a, a substantial error in recovering that counterfactual ozone trend that suggests that um, sort of traditional statistical methods aren't really telling us the, quote, real influence of, of emissions trends. And, and importantly, there's actually some residual error that comes from the fact that a bit of that emissions and meteorolo meteorological trend is inseparable. Um, that is some of that um, that trend is, is driven by the interactions. We actually calculated that um, using some sensitivity studies in the GF chem model. I'm not gonna talk about that today, but um, the bottom line is that the, the ceiling of that statistical correction hasn't quite been, been reached yet. You could do a little bit better with statistics and potentially some, some newer machine learning methods. So what's the upshot of this for looking at uh, trends in ozone over the US um, in terms of diagnosing the trend relative to observational constraints. Um, we ob obviously don't have the counterfactual in the real data, um, but we can look at the performance of these relative correction methods when we apply them to real data uh, compared to our model. Now, what we're showing here is for regions of the US um, in the GeoSCAM model, our counterfactual, the average trend in parts per billion per year, the uncorrected trend and corrected with different methods, and then for everything except the counterfactual, let's match that to observations. And what you see is that um, the uncorrected and, and also the, um, the multiple linear regression trend are more negative than um, 
our what we think is our best performing method, the um, random forest regional method. So this kind of detail is actually important going forward, thinking about accountability for policy, um, but also for variability. Um, but it's important to remember that people actually experience the uncorrected ozone. Uh, so thinking about those in tandem is important. And finally, I want to end with a bit of a teaser for future work, um, how we're thinking about combining the influences of, of greenhouse gas control and precursor emissions together and taking into account uncertainty. And this is work with uh, Sebastian Easton at MIT. So we're using this ensemble simulation we have of a varying climate um, in the GeoSchem model uh, to design response surfaces where we can really diagnose um, the influence of radiative forcing and the influence of changes, for example, in NOx emissions um, together. So one vector in this surface is the climate penalty. It basically says, um, you know, you, can, you want to keep emissions constant and you look at the influence of changes in, in your radiative forcing. But we are in fact living on, living on this surface. Um, and our ensemble simulation will allow us to better explore that whole space in ways that also can take into account equity concerns by retaining some of the spatial variability. Um, for here, for example, we're plotting percent of the US population that exceeds um, a certain ozone threshold. And we can look at how the prospects of that, for that change with radi changing radiated forcing and changing NOx emissions um, vary. And this is, uh, this is actually showing the mean, but we also have distributions for each of these, which show the variability. And one of the things we're hoping is that this kind of analysis will help advance thinking beyond the one dimensional picture of the climate penalty and ultimately serve as a model for how to assess multiple policy levers in combination that can help influence outcomes and hopefully relevant to a broad scale set of transitions towards sustainability. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll end and, and I'm happy to take questions. Hey, thanks very much. We do have some time for questions. So um, maybe anyone who has questions can line up at the microphone. Uh, Martha and Dan are monitoring for questions online. Uh, so please introduce yourself and then go ahead with your question. Ivan? Ivan Rusin, uh, Texas A&M University and Research Committee. Uh, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. I wonder if you can maybe add a few more things on the um, choices for Policymaking, uh, you know, doing this on these eight-hour peaks versus averages, because uh, you know the nonlinearities, as you mentioned, with uh, with other pollutants, uh, lowering ozone has been argued by some may lead to unintended consequences, especially in some of the urban pockets. And environmental justice and other issues will come into play at the extreme regional level, even though that policies, you know, would not be able to be directed at those very specific neighborhoods. Yeah, so so thanks for the question. I think there are, there are a few things that are that are embedded in that. Um, one of which is is thinking about peaks versus versus averages, and um, I think I'll I'll leave some of that to um, some of the later presentations that talk about the uh, responses to ozone exposure. Um, we do try to use the most um, the most relevant um, outcomes focused on health impacts. Um, not necessarily the the number of exceedances. Um, again, we don't we don't capture that uh, particularly well in, in a lot of the a lot of the type of models we use. And we think that um, based on some of the um, information we have from from exposure, the um, the overall levels are, are more useful to to think about. Um, yeah, with respect to spatial variability, um, again, yeah, thinking about the different um, the different aspects of how um, how the um, the spatial variability is is prompted by by different policies. You'll really need models at a variety of different levels, and I think what we're trying to do is say that you know these kind of approaches that look at probabilistic um, evaluation and variability are the ones you want to use no matter what spatial variability you prioritize, um, because you know it can happen that you get a particularly warm year or a particularly cool year or a year where, where there's a lot of stagnation events. So, um, so I think I would make a more general point about the, the ways in which you would want to assess it rather than um, any particular, highlight any particular policy lever. Uh, we're really talking about a, a means of, a, an approach to assessment. 
Hey, uh, thank you. Uh, I guess next question there from uh, Brian. Go ahead, Brian. Hi, Noel. This is Brian Hubble uh, with EPA. Um, following up uh, on, the, on the previous question a bit, um, but a little more focus on, on uh, health implications. And one of the things that, that I think would be nice to be able to look at is the combination of, um, of an increase in ozone and an increase in heat events. Um, you know, when we talk about sort of the, the, where the ozone season is going, and we start thinking about the co-occurrence of heat waves along with high ozone, that can potentially have a, you know, a, a more than linear additive effect in terms of, of population health effects, especially in things like ur urban heat islands and so forth. So I wonder if you could talk to how the, your model might be extended to look at this combination of, of heat and ozone. Yes, um, that's, that's actually a, a topic of, of much interest. Um, and I think what we're, what we're thinking about, um, we have a, a project that we're recently starting looking at trying to project new ways to, um, to think about climate modeling um, into the future and ways in which we can run some of these ensemble simulations faster. Because I think what, what our previous work has showed is that if you want to look at um, sort of these variabilities and particularly these co-occurrences, you really need ensemble simulations to um, sort of better characterize those impacts. The problem that you run into is that they're really computationally intensive, um, particularly if you want to look at very finely resolved de spatial detail. So at the, um, so I think what we really need to do is, is get more higher fidelity sort of reduced form kinds of approaches that project these impacts better, more probabilistically, and are able to do that together without hamstringing the whole community in doing 100 year ensembles all the time for every single possible policy, um, policy proposal. Um, so, so this is my sort of plea for for better and faster assessment tools, I think, and and one of my next projects will be uh, trying to work with a, a broader team at MIT to to help develop some of those. Okay, great, thanks. I don't see anyone standing up or anyone standing up online. I have a one quick question since we've got a little bit more time left, and I note in you know in the in what you've been talking about, and also in the earlier uh, the review of sort of the current of knowledge for ozone the you know the term that's used in terms of the sensitive field is heat waves not temperature um can you explain a bit more why it's referred that way is heat waves a broader thing that includes more than just temperature in the effect um i'm i'm not sure that's um i, I think um I'm not sure what that distinction really, really is between heat waves and temperature. I know that you know elevated, elevated heat for multiple days certainly is associated um, with with increases in ozone. So sort of that um, associated with those regional stagnation events. But but that's something I'll look into and why that particular study referred to to heat waves specifically. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Okay, we're out of time for this session, so we're going to move on to the next one. Um, and Jennifer, you're going to go ahead and reduce our next, introduce our next speaker. Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker is Tad Aburn. Uh, Tad Aburn is currently a senior advisor for the Maryland Department of the Environment. Through May of 2022, Mr. Aburn was the air director in Maryland, a position he held for over 10 years. Mr. Aburn is a graduate of Brown University and has held numerous leadership positions in air quality organizations over the past 20 years. He was a two-term president of the National Association of Clean Air Agencies and has chaired many committees and boards for groups like the Ozone Transportation Commission, or OTC, and the Mid-Atlantic Regional Air Management Administration. Mr. Aburn was directly involved in the adoption of the Maryland Healthy Air Act in 2006, the Maryland Clean Cars Act in 2007, and the 2009 and 2016 Maryland Greenhouse Gas Emission Reductions Act. Mr. Aburn has also managed a 30-year ozone transport research partnership with the University of Maryland, Howard University, NOAA, NASA, and NIST. Uh, Mr. Aburn is retiring in November of 2022. Um, so, Tad, we will turn it over to you for, for your talk on ozone and climate change challenges and opportunities. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I'm hoping you can hear me and you can see my screen. We can hear you and see your screen, see your slides. Great. Well, thank you very much. And thank you for the kind introduction. Um, I think I was asked to be on this policy because I'm sort of one of those frontline people that 
has done this job for a long time and has seen what's worked and what hasn't worked. And so I have done quite a bit of research uh, or, or been part of research teams, mostly the atmospheric chemistry piece and the transport piece, uh, not the health piece. And so, uh, so I'll, I'll provide you a little bit of an update on, on what's been going on in Maryland and what that means to this issue of the, the climate penalty. So a little bit of background. Um, what's happened in Maryland, um, a little discussion on the, the seriousness of the climate penalty, and then um, a little bit of a prediction for ozone and also fine particles in terms of where we're gonna go in the east. Um, and then I, 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 I do have a couple things I'd like to push at the folks that are part of this uh, conference. Uh, I always like to provide challenges to the people in certain areas. And so I'll, I'll be talking about a little bit about how to evolve climate policy and some key issues that the health professionals can really help us with on the front line. So a little background, uh, we've got a long sorted history on air pollution. Um, I've been there for a lot of it. I've been doing this for almost 40 years. And so there was that era where, where the air was so bad, you could smell it, taste it, see it. You could hardly sometimes stand it. Uh, luckily, those days are in the past. I think Denora, Pennsylvania was one of those famous events. And then in the 2005 era, Maryland also had some of the worst ozone in the country and the worst fine particle matter in the country. Um, Noel may have been part of this very famous 2005 MIT study where we got quite a little bit of press because we were identified as having some of the riskiest air to breathe anywhere east of the Mississippi. Um, and then in 2008, um, EPA designated the Baltimore area in Maryland as the worst ozone area outside of California and in Texas. And again, this is all on measured data. So it, we, we did have the highest ozone in the east in 2008. The good, so somewhere around 2010, things began to change. Um, and right now we are in attainment with every single standard uh, except for ozone. And in 2020, um, we reported the very, I'll share some graphs on this in a minute, but so we recorded the fewest bad ozone days ever recorded in Maryland in 2020. So even ozone is getting significantly better than it used to. A little bit of ozone levels in Maryland and a little bit on the mid-Atlantic. I will tell you that I, I understand the ozone issue on the East Coast and in the East very well. A lot of my experience is probably not the best experience for how things are going to work in California or other parts of the West. But in the East, a lot of our research um, that we've done in Maryland has extended pretty much uh, into the, mid the Midwest and the South too. So. Uh, a little a little short snapshot of where we are with the standards. Uh, this is all the NAAQS criteria pollutants on one slide. The dotted line is the standard, and you can see where we are with all of the standards, um, SO2, NO2, fine particles, daily, annual, and ozone. And you can sort of see that somewhere in that 2000 to 2010 time frame, something changed and we went from um, having all sorts of problems with standards to, uh, to, to being below the standard. And I'll talk about each one a little bit, but it's been interesting. And some of the conclusions I reach are driven by sort of this, this, this change that happened somewhere in that 2000 to 2010 timeframe. For ozone, um, we all count days. I'm not sure that's the best metric to look at, at ozone with, but we count days. And so this is just a, a, a graph that shows using the eight hour, the, the current eight hour standard, sort of where we were between 2010 and 2021. And you can see some fairly good progress in terms of the number of days. And we are sort of in a plateau right now where we have, you know, 10 to, to, to 20, 10 to 15 bad days a year. We did have a very unusual year in 2020. Uh, I think a lot of folks know 2020 was a very unusual year. We, uh, we, we had only three days where we went above the ozone standard. Um, for fine particles, I'm not going to talk a lot about fine particles, but I think this is a really interesting story uh, for Maryland. Um, again, we had some of the worst fine particle levels in the country. Uh, I think this is what drove the MIT conclusion that our air was so risky to breathe. But uh, somewhere around 2010, 2015, we started to get below the standard, and we know a new standard's coming, and I'm fully supportive of a new standard, and I uh, actually am a believer in trying to get the fine particle emissions to the point where we have zero uh, fine particle levels. So, you know, 
So, so, but we've continued to go down and that's very interesting as to why that has happened. Um, and I think part of it is policy driven by EPA and state programs. But I also think a big part of this is a shifting energy world where we're seeing markets and behaviors, consumer behaviors drive choices that are uh, driving down um, in, my, in the East, SO2 is the key driver for, for fine particle levels. And uh, the energy choices are, are the energy trends, the markets are, are driving major change. Um, and again, we expect things to continue to get better. A different way to look at fine particles is sort of, this is a, a, a animation between early 2000s to 2022, the greens are cleaner, the reds and the purples are bad, but you can really see progress, spatial progress, risk reduction. Again, I'm not a big believer in counting days. I am a big believer in looking at reductions across an area. And I think you really can get a better feel for the potential risk reductions associated with the reduced fine particles when you look at things spatially, not just counting bad days. Um, and again, we have this graph for the entire East if folks are interested, but it tells a really interesting story on fine particles and also on ozone. This is a slide, I don't have this in the animated version, but this is just sort of a snapshot in 98, snapshot in 2021. And so we, we not only see the number of days going down, but we see the spatial exposure to ozone going down very significantly. Um, reds and purples are bad. And again, this is all, 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 all consistent with the current eight hour ozone standard where the greens and yellows are also much better. So again, we've seen significant progress, not only in the number of days, but in the, the, the spatial risk reduction to me is one of the most important things we ought to be talking about. A real quick understanding, a lot of times in the media, you see number of bad days used to talk about areas or non-attainment area problems. And our, our, our bad days have changed, particularly over the past 15 years. Um, on the left, the red and orange plot is a real day um, uh, from 2012. And you'll see we have widespread non-attainment across the entire state of Maryland, where some of the levels not only are above the standard, but in the very unhealthy range, the reds. And then if you take a look on the bottom right, you can see that this is a bad day in 2021, where we, we don't have the widespread exposure to unhealth or the, to the levels above the standard. Um, in other words, this day is a very small area in Edgewood, Maryland, bumped up just above the standard. And, and this counts as a bad day under the Clean Air Act. Um, but they're not the same in terms of risk. They're not the same in terms of exposure. And so I think it's really important to understand that that the nature of ozone in the East has not only changed in terms of the, the number of bad days we have, but also in the spatial exposure. So in 2021, about half of our days or over half of our days looked like this um, plot on the right. So it's not just a single day piece, it's a multi-day piece. Um, and so why? I mean, what, what happened in that 2000 to 2010, 2015 time frame? We have fewer bad days, a dramatic, dramatic reduction in spatial exposure. And what I'm showing for Maryland is, it's true for many areas in the East, perhaps not the New York, New Jersey, Connecticut area. But again, research did a lot of the driving of this. Um, and again, even though ozone is an extremely complicated problem, uh, theoretically, the control strategies that have driven the progress have not been complicated at all. What we now know is that widespread regional NOx emissions reduce ozone and they've reduced ozone across most of the East. Again, I can't speak for California, but I know that in the East, widespread regional NOx programs have worked, both for um, the power sector and for the mobile sector. Um, and to be honest with you, um, I think my local reductions in Maryland, we have a very aggressive program in Maryland, mimicking many of the California programs. I think they help, but in my 39 years of experience, I've never been able to look at one of my local programs and say, see, it actually did lower ozone in the years after we implemented it. With the regional programs, you can see that. You can see ozone go down 
when the when the programs are implemented. And again, the re widespread regional NOx reductions uh, came from both power plants, mobile sources, and other sources. And we literally can link the drops in ozone to uh, the power plant control strategies. And that's because those strategies have specific deadlines. We believe the mobile source NOx is just as e equally important, but it's harder to, to actually see those changes in the measured ozone because of the way the mobile source strategies are implemented through slow vehicle turnover. You don't get that dramatic change in a specific year. Um, what was the big game changer? Well, of course, NOx reductions was the big game changer, but I think there's a piece of it that a lot of people don't understand, which is that the NOx reductions have not only lowered ozone, they've changed the atmosphere of chemistry in a lot of the East. Um, so we, again, our research programs focused on this quite a bit. So in 2022, a ton of NOx reductions will actually get us greater ozone benefit in Maryland than that same ton of NOx reductions would have done in 2000. And so this change in the ozone production efficiency has been really, really important. And that's why you've seen some of our programs actually sort of go into hyper gear as more NOx reductions have taken place, the ozone dropped and continued to drop. Um, I do not believe that the ozone production efficiency, we've done some research with the, the, the folks up in New York, New Jersey. I don't think they've reached the tipping point for the ozone production efficiency change. I think they're getting much closer. But I think uh, the bottom line is the NOx in the air up in that area is much more driven by mobile sources than power plant sources. And so New York City has a way to go, but I think uh, the tipping point is, is coming in a few years. Um, the climate penalty. Um, I do think it's gonna make things a lot more difficult uh, for ozone, but I, I'm not sure it's gonna change that much as long as we continue to implement the basic policies we're implementing to reduce the lower ozone and the lower fine particle emissions. Um, I, so the climate penalty in Maryland has been interesting because it does affect more than temperature. And what's happened in Maryland is that some of the non-temperature issues have actually helped lower ozone. I'll go through an example of that in a second. Um, and again, in the East, the policies that we need to reduce ozone and fine particles and haze are pretty clear cut and straightforward. Uh, I think it's just doing more of those regional NOx reductions, regional SO2 reductions. And if we continue to do that, we're gonna continue to see progress in most of the East uh, with, with fine particles, ozone and regional haze. Um, I also think that the climate mitigation challenge may be the biggest challenge that we have right now at the state and local and federal policy level. I think those changes will drive a lot of change for ozone. And I think that, um, that, that it's gonna take time. I think the big issue with climate mitigation is not what to do, but it's how fast to do it. And I think that will be the big challenge. Um, Somehow locking up here. Hold on one second. For some reason, um, my slides don't want to proceed. Let me see if I can figure out what I got going wrong here. For some reason, my slides have locked up. Do you want to try and stop sharing and yeah, reshare again, if that's possible? Stop sharing and then I will reshare. Okay, great. There we go. So this is just a snapshot. This is from some of our research. This shows the East Coast and this shows power plant emissions as they looked um, in the 2010 era. Um, the larger green and orange are large sources of SO2 and NOx. 
And in Maryland, and this is when we had the worst the ozone in the East. Um, if I overlay the classic ozone weather pattern that drove high ozone in Maryland in those days, high pressure system sets over the sets up over the southeast. Uh, air flows counterclockwise around that high pressure system. What you can see is that aloft air is circulating just over the Ohio River Valley, pulling uh, power plant pollution from the Ohio River Valley into Maryland. Um, emissions went down. That's a great thing. We started to see lower ozone. And it's also important that this is where the was this was the end of the tailpipe in the 2010 type era. And what we used to do is we'd fly our airplanes and do our research up here. And, uh, you know, when I first started doing this research, we would literally measure 110 parts per billion aloft right in this area, coming directly into the Maryland area. Now we no longer see that. We see 50, 60, 70 ppb aloft. And with that, our ground level ozone has changed. The aloft air does mix down every morning as the nighttime inversion collapses and the aloft air mixes down, but it's been a real game changer. Now, what has happened in Maryland is that not only have we seen the benefit of the reduced emissions, we've also seen a benefit because the, 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 the areas that the high pressure system set up has moved a little bit to the north and the east. And so we're no longer at the end of the tailpipe either. Um, if you if you look hard at sort of where the high pressure systems push ozone to these days, again, the emissions went down, but it really looks right at the New York City, New Jersey, Connecticut area, which is clearly the area that has the toughest ozone problem right now on, in the east. So we've had an interesting phenomenon in Maryland where the climate penalty actually, because of the way the high pressure systems are shifting, has actually lowered ozone or helped us lower ozone. I don't think that's the case in many areas, but at least for us, I, I, I think the, 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 the way the high pressure systems have changed has helped us lower our ozone. Um, a few predictions for the future. Um, I do believe that, um, that for the East, because of the fact that we have a pretty clear understanding of the policies that are needed to continue to reduce ozone and continue to reduce fine particles and continue to, do, to, to make progress on regional haze, I think we will continue to see that progress. I think we have some very aggressive programs that have happened both at the federal and state level for both power plants, uh, for, for light duty mobile vehicles, and now you're seeing a lot of activity in heavy duty mobile mo 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 mobile sources, uh, particularly the, the, the medium light and heavy duty truck sector. Um, and again, these super regional programs that reduce both NOx and sulfur dioxide from power plants, mobile sources, they will continue to get stronger each year. And I, I do believe we will continue to see ozone levels, fine particle levels and regional haze get better across the East. We also have some interesting things happening um, that are non-regulatory. We've seen huge changes in the markets, uh, particularly the energy market. We've seen a real shift away from uh, coal. We now see a lot of natural gas and we're seeing a change even there because the role of renewable energy has, uh, has become a, a, a more realistic thing. And within the next few years, I, I hope to see some real changes in the way the markets work. For, we're seeing them already in terms of renewable energy. Um, and also the climate change policy piece is really important. I mean, to me, this is the big challenge for us regulators in the future is to make these climate change policies happen and to get them done quickly. Probably the big challenge is timing. These are, these are programs that, that take time, but we have, we have advancements in a whole host of areas. Technology is improving. Technologies we didn't even think were possible 15 years ago are now coming out, uh, energy storage, things like that. Um, we're also seeing consumer demand change a lot of what the private sector is pushing, uh, you know, electric vehicles. 20 years ago, 15 years ago, we're a, we're a, a wild dream. And now we're seeing the markets push so hard to make that change happen. And I also think it's really important that one of the good things that's interesting about climate change is it's, it's brought back the concept of zero emissions. I remember when I first started doing this work in the uh, late 80s and 90s, we used to always talk about policies that would eventually drive us towards zero emissions. And somehow this concept that all we need to do is meet standards and we're done 
um, took over. Now with climate change, you're seeing a really refreshing new focus on how do we get to zero emissions? It might not be simple and easy and fast, but that needs to be our long-term goal. And I think that's a really important concept. So um, rethinking the policy process. Uh, Noel and I had some similar, th similar things we, we, I think we were looking at. Um, I do believe we should be rethinking the, the policy process. Uh, being a realist, however, because of the way our laws work, this is much easier said than done. Um, we do have laws that drive us to do single pollutant work, but I do believe climate change is the big driver and who knows what's gonna be happening with legislation or new policy on climate change. Again, the zero emission piece is I think really important. We now have, Maryland has a very aggressive climate change program and we are literally pushing you know, with this concept that yes, we need incremental targets to get to, but in the long run, we need a zero emission based policy across the board. Will we get there with everything? I'm not sure, but should we be trying hard? Should we be challenging the engineers of the world to figure out new technologies? Absolutely. Um, so um, I think the climate strategies are gonna drive huge progress for fine particles, ozone and other criteria pollutants. They are very deep. They are very much moving towards zero emissions. Um, so I have a lot of hope that the climate policy will, will continue to drive po uh, progress on ozone, fine particles, and other criteria pollutants. Um, so um, some of the big challenges I'd like to put on your plate, a bunch of folks from the health community, I really believe the form of the ozone standard needs to be fixed. I think it's driving bad policy right now. A, a policy that the form of the standard is the piece that says, you know, um, re, the fourth worst day averaged over three years is gonna give you the standard. I think it focuses way too much on bad days and doesn't allow us to do what we ought to really be doing, which is to reduce overall risk, not just to try to shave peaks. The issue of cumulative exposure is one that I know a lot of folks think it is a, an interesting research project, but we're facing it right now. All of our environmental justice work is dealing with this issue of, we breathe more than just ozone. We breathe more than just fine particles. We breathe air toxics. So to me, that's one of the biggest challenges for the health community is to figure out how to look at multiple pollutant exposures, especially in areas that are already overburdened um, with air pollution. Um, I also think we really need to look at short-term exposure scenarios. Um, there's this growth in low-cost sensors to measure air quality. It's, it's taking, it's taking, it's going, it's going like crazy across the country. I now have four areas with these, these sensor hyperlocal networks. And the issue it really brings up is what does this very high spike mean? for 10 minutes. We don't have good answers for that. We'd love to have those answers. Um, again, I'd also love to have the health community talk about some of the health benefits that we hopefully are seeing because ozone and fine particle pollution have dropped so dramatically across the East over the past 10 years. It would be really rewarding to us regulators to actually sort of understand how much this really is or isn't affecting asthma, hospital visitations. Um, I know that research takes time, but it would be really great to see that not only have we lowered the levels that we're actually doing what we're supposed to be doing, which is protecting public health. And again, one last piece, which is um, we're in the business now of communicating about health and communicating about risk than we've ever been in our entire careers, because mostly it's a lot of work driven by environmental justice and working with communities. But it is a real challenge for us, talking about health, talking about risk. And I would encourage, uh, we've been doing some of this work with the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School people. I would encourage the, uh, the, 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 the professionals, the health professionals to, to reach out and work with your state and local regulators to do a better job of communicating risk. With that, I'll end it and take a few questions if folks have them. Uh, and again, if you wanted to follow up with an email, feel free. Okay, great. Thanks very much. Um, well, unfortunately, we have really used up our time. So I think we're going to have to cut it without questions, Tad. Um, uh, you said that people can contact you by email with questions. I'm 
I am really pleased with the amount of knowledge you've shared with us over this time. It's fantastic. I think we should strike out that last thing about you retiring because you're you got so much to share uh, and lots of food for thought. So thanks very much. Now everybody, remember uh, we've got lunch now, um, and we're due back here at what. 115. So I hope to see you back at 115 for the remainder of this session that so far I think has been excellent.